Oh boy, it's been a while since I've done a physics-based reaction video and that is exactly what we'll be doing today. How's it going folks? Jack here with another video. So today I'll be checking out a video from Kyle Hill on how Dead Space sold the Fermi Paradox. For those of you who do not know, the Fermi Paradox is uh, one very interesting theory. I don't know why I'm sounding so cynical saying this, but it's essentially like Omni-Man talking with Mark. Like, boy, you ain't special. Have you seen the vastness of the universe? Yeah. What's another 500 billion years? Yeah. The universe can always make another one. Bruh. It's kind of like that. But of course, we have a lot more presuppositions about the intelligence and or just survival aspect of the species that need to be found. And of course, also the Drake equation, which I actually once did a presentation on. It's... It's kind of stupid. But given that I played Dead Space last year and it's a remake this year, this is very interesting. So let's watch. Where is everyone? And no, I don't mean all of you humans back there on that increasingly hot blue marble. I mean, <laughs> where are all the aliens? In a universe this vast, surely there must be other forms of life that are as depressed to be meat as we are, right? <laughs> well, if hand. one of my favorite sci-fi video games is correct, Aliens are nice. indeed out there. We're just never going to meet them because, well, already they're here. already dead. <laughs> it's a spooky. Scary. Now entering the facility. A lower estimate on the number of stars in this galaxy is 100 billion. Yep. A lower estimate on the number of galaxies in this universe is another sweet hundy billy. A lower estimate for the number of planets around each star in the universe is at least one. This gives us an enormous figure, so that even if the chance of life arising in the universe is like winning a mega bucks jackpot powerball lottery thing, <laughs> it still means that there are a hundred million planets out there with alien life on it. So I ask you again, where is everyone? Well, this discrepancy that we are highlighting is known as the Fermi Paradox, named after Chad Estimator Enrico and famous Fermi. Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. Who, by the way, for all my uh, boys and girls out there, Chads and Chadettes interested in physics, uh, the Oppenheimer movie is coming out this summer. And hopefully, wait, is it summer? Yes, July 21st. But when that movie comes out, hopefully, I haven't checked out the casting, but uh, they, they may feature Enrico Fermi as he was the very first to build a nuclear reactor. So while Oppenheimer is the guy that is known the most, I guess that he should get a shout out as well. There are many potential solutions to this paradox from the fact that we may indeed be alone in the universe or that civilizations just tend to wipe themselves out before they can reach out to other civilizations. Today, Maybe. we're gonna focus on a different solution, one offered by one of my favorite video games ever, Dead Space. Its solution is that space seems dead out there because it literally is dead. Ooh, isn't that spooky, Arya? Arya, isn't that spooky? Spooky. Oh, to the moon. Okay, so from what I understand so far, we are not dealing with quote unquote intelligent life because it is like a thing that needs to be defined correctly right because when we talk intelligence it's usually referred to species that have the ability to receive information and utilize them to the benefit of their survival with the expression of the acute senses like the sense of touch smell sight everything and this is something that most current creatures do have whether we're talking about a sapien to an ape to a fish in the sea a goddamn fly like we do express all of these senses differently but we can use them for survival yet this intelligence is not always utilized in that way, like for example the goddamn koala who wants to kill itself on a daily basis. So when we're talking civilization, of course, because it's dead space, we're not talking about something that is quote-unquote alive. It's not to our level of intelligence, it has to be mostly dead and also if we're talking about purely biomass, yeah, that will make a lot more sense to go with something that is near dead or at least in a bacterial level. What we don't find out until Dead Space 3 is that the so-called necromorphs aren't the end of that ghoulish life cycle. Huh. No, these eldritch horrors um, are. Brethren moons, moons. or brother moons. Yeah. Literally giant tentacle monsters that float through space and they're the size of a the moon. Their life cycle goes something like this. 
First, they start sending out electromagnetic waves that make any intelligent life in the area go totally cray cray and build so-called markers. Now yeah. these markers also send out electromagnetic radiation to animate any dead flesh in the area, somehow. Then that dead flesh goes on to kill other stuff to make enough Isaac. dead flesh. Once there's enough dead flesh, it is all flung up into the upper atmosphere somehow, somehow where it congeals <laughs> somehow into a giant tentacled moon that then eats the rest of the planet's biomass and continues the cycle anew. This is dead space solution to the Fermi paradox. Space seems dead because these brother moons are floating around everywhere gobbling up everything. Now I gotta admit, Brother Moons are some of my favorite creature creations in sci-fi, but it all got me thinking. Is there actually enough biomass on Earth to make a moon-sized meat thing out of? <laughs> Winston, calm down. Uh, Clean your tentacles last Tuesday. No. You know what day it is. It's not Tuesday. That's why I named it. No. It's not Tentacle Tuesday. You know what it is. In the vacuum of space, outside of any other large dominating gravitational influence like your mama, anything with mass will pull on anything else. Oh, cheeky. Now that's what I like. A clever your mama joke. Neat. With mass and eventually come together. So if you had enough dead flesh in space after a convergence event from the necromorphs, it would start to accumulate in a sort of gross meat moon kind of thing. And if you had enough of this dead flesh, you could even have it differentiate like a planet with a molten, bubbly, gross flesh sure. core. Thanks for that random and row of Yikes. SKCD. So this is, by the way, what we call hydrostatic equilibrium, which dependent on how it is that this time around, I guess, the moon is formed. It could be by the way that all the bodies are flung together into it. And of course, the material, which is this case is flesh, um, dictates that anything or heavenly body that exceeds a thousand kilometers starts collapsing within itself. That of course, if the thermal pressure and the weight of the material are high enough, then it would collapse on itself and adapt to most efficient shape there is, which is in this case a sphere smooth on every angle. To evaluate today's proposed solution to the Fermi paradox, what we're gonna do is see how big a meat moon would be if it consumed all biomass on Earth, and then compare that to other known moons and the game. And That's thankfully, the calculations are big. actually super simple for this. Easy for you. No, Aria, anyone can do them. With the power of mathematics, you can go, hey, Winston, grab a calculator, I'll lead you through it. Oh, Dang. we did that once. I say so we. how do we I go <laughs> about estimating the mass and size of a brother moon? First, we need to know how much biomass is on Earth. Mm. Scientists have been estimating these values for a One long time. Tera. Estimates vary across studies, but generally, in terms of the distribution of carbon in everything from viruses to your butt, all the animals on Earth represent actually a tiny, tiny fraction of the total. Yeah, as you can see, bacteria is quite a lot, which is why when in the decomposition process, that's where you get most of the hunt biomass. There is more weight in all the other kingdoms, like protists and archaea and fungi. Bacteria outweigh every animal on Earth 50 times over, and the Damn. vast majority of carbon on Earth plants. is in plants. The latest studies calculate that all of this living stuff weighs around 1.2 teratons. Okay, 1.2. Now, 1 we're going to do this back of the envelope and assume that all Earth goop has roughly the same density. How about water? We can then divide Earth's total biomass by this density to get the potential total volume of a dead meat marble with tentacles. Okay. Doing so, the maximum volume that a brother moon from dead space could get from Earth is over a thousand cubic kilometers. Yeah. That sounds like a lot, right? Well, if you have enough mass in space, it will the act volume to of sphere. itself via gravity. Therefore, a neat moon with sufficient mass would have a volume equal to the volume of a sphere, four-thirds pi r cubed. Now, as the astute among you will notice, that means that if we plug in our volume value and solve for r here, we will get the radius of this eldritch monstrosity, and then we can compare that radius to other known moons and to the game. That's... 
trying to impress myself here if I uh, that's 6.2 right kilometers I'm rounding things together here with a thousand kilometers instead but 6.2 add the two extra so that's six point f that's four more so 6.6 6. so uh do that go ahead yeah. feel free to pause the video now I'll wait, I'll wait here, or I'll lead you through it in just a okay, couple Okay, uh, just to double check. Few moments later. Well, it's great that I still have maple, so yeah, it's 6.6 .6 kilometers. Seconds. Winston, just, just smack a tentacle onto a calculator and it'll stick there and... The answer is a moon with a radius over six kilometers long. Yeah, that's now, small. Now, that sounds huge. Anything overhead in a sphere like that would be really, really disturbing. But is it, like, moon size disturbing? Well, comparing it to the radius of Earth's moon, uh, Earth's moon has a radius 260 times larger. Yep. Larger. Larger. Meaning that if all life on Earth was spherified into a civilization extinguishing meat orb of doom and gross meat, remember, it wouldn't be any larger or any more imposing than any other moon in the solar system that you could probably name. Which is interesting because as I at least defined before, the whole of it getting into a spherical shape is also dependent of how massive it is. Surely there are moons in our solar system that are smaller than the 6.6, .6, right? They're still defined as moons, so Pluto, have a field day. <laughs> but in theory, then, you'll have to take into account the density of every single thing to make it fit, and still, would it be that massive still? But I'm making it way more complicated than it needs to be. We are in pretend territory here. Now, Winston, I know what you're thinking. Don't get tentacle envy, my man. There are dozens of really tiny moons in our solar system around our gas giants. So some of those are only like a kilometer across, meaning that a meat moon made out of all life on Earth would still be a moon. <laughs> You're welcome. Given that Dead Space's proposed solution to the Fermi paradox actually does result in a mini moon's worth of mass, the next question is how realistic is a brother moon as a creature? Well, yeah. interestingly enough, one proposed solution to the Fermi paradox is kind of similar to Dead Space in this regard. It says that we're not finding any aliens because we're not looking at where they actually lived. Venus. Or died. For decades, scientists and sci-fi authors alike have imagined what life, unlike anything we know, might look like. One popular conception is life among the atmospheres of gas giants like Jupiter huh, and Saturn. Cosmos. Imagine an entire ecosystem with aerial plankton grazed on by sky whales who are preyed upon in turn by flying sharks. Wow. Now it sounds like a fanciful thing that some scientists on the ganja would think of, but none other than Carl Sagan was writing scientific papers on this in the oh. 1970s, calculating the lives of what he called sinkers and floaters in the high atmospheres of Jupiter. Huh. Now, I don't think the jump from an organism like this to a brother moon in dead space, in the vacuum of space, is all that crazy. Imagine a creature in the high atmosphere of some gas giant, evolving to resist low pressures and high radiation environments for millions or perhaps billions of years. Eventually, like the transition that happened from water to land on Earth, these creatures cast off into the void, using internally generated gases to propel them and sensory organs to hone in on other worlds' magnetospheres oh, that sounds air, cool. food, and water. It makes me think of, uh, what's the name of that guy? Sam Warrington? Who, the one who played... Um, damn, God, in, in Avatar, the main character, Jake Sully. He did play another movie where he also was preparing to migrate into another planet. Or was it a moon of Jupiter? Nope, I'm completely wrong. That was uh, Titan, uh, Saturn's moon. Yeah, where he was adapting into yet another life form and getting on that planet full of toxic seas. So, like, it's, uh, 
It's a plausible idea. These beings could exist in a state of suspended animation, like we know tardigrades, tardigrades on Earth yeah. can achieve. Perhaps conserving metabolism and resisting cosmic radiation for tens of thousands of years while they move through the void looking for a new planet to feed on. It's certainly not the craziest idea I've ever heard in sci-fi. Think about it. If beings like this exist, then it seems like there's no one out there because we're only looking for signals from planets and stars. We wouldn't hear a thing. No. And we'd never get to hear from the dead planets that they fed on either. It's kind of a scary, fun idea, huh? Yeah. Kind of like the game that came up with it. <laughs> Until next time. Winston, you don't have to keep thanking me. It's not even Tuesday. You're welcome, though. Bye. Now exiting the facility. Well, it is Tuesday on my day of recording. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. If you want to join the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, if you want to get members-only access to our Discord, you want private live streams each month, if you want videos early, behind the scenes, photos and videos, everything, go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today. And as you can see, there's already hundreds and hundreds of you. Because if you support us just enough, you get your name on Aria here and you get to live in the glory. That's fine. So go do it. So I know what you're thinking, Kyle. What if the Brother Moon went to a different planet with a lot more life on it and then it could make a, you know, Earth moon sized moon and be more accurate to what we see in the games? I hear what you're saying. I just want to put some scale in, in your mind here. For just humans to make a human-sized meat moon that's disgusting and molten in the center and bubbly and don't worry about it, you'd need a hundred billion times more humans than exist right now. So <laughs> I like that. I, I wanted to stop to ask if somebody would have asked a question like this. What would he have said? But he covered that very well. And you also need to take into account how quickly that is going to happen. Like surely, our current population I exploded exponentially as of the last few half of a century. But from the good old, what is it, tree? 3.8 now that we consider the time of abiogenesis, uh, where life sprang out till today, that's how far we've gotten. Of course, we've lost a lot of people through death and disease and all that. But if we're talking biomass purely, that's how much we have. And that space takes place in 2500. So how much do you expect the, the process to go? Well, at least, of course, there's me talking in Earth proportions. But then you need to have a space-faring civilization that would travel across space and get there by that time, before the brother moons. And even before that, because they were already present on the Earth, because they did put the marker there before that killed the dinosaurs. What the f- <laughs> This space is weird. So we're talking about a planet with so much more biomass than you think. Everything on this planet, except the humans, there's a hundred billion more of them. And our planet can't even sustain that. So there's- a lot of things would have to change to get a real human meat moon. Don't yeah. Google that. <laughs> wow, that was fun. But guys, as always, please do go and subscribe to Kyle Hill here for more fun physics-based stuff. And of course, here on the channel occasionally when I, I, I get to do that. But if you like the video, give the video a like and uh, subscribe if you want to see some more. With that said, we should all have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye.